good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, right now, and uh, it means a lot to us that, uh, that you're taking the time to be with us this evening. I want to start tonight by acknowledging that we're hosting this webinar from the unceded Lekwungen territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt peoples. We're talking this evening about unceded Nuchatlet territory and wherever you're joining us from, you're on the land of an indigenous people. And I encourage all of us to think about our roles on these lands and if and how we're complicit in colonialism and what our responsibilities are to address that. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Torrance Cost. I'm the campaign director for the Wilderness Committee and we're working to support the new Chatlet people as they fight to get their land back. We're an environmental organization, but we know that there won't be justice for the forests, for the lands and waters on New Chatlet territory, unless there is justice for the people that belong to them. So we're honored to be helping uh, fight for that justice. Our lead on this and the main organizer of the webinar tonight is our campaign organizer, Emily Hoffpower, who you'll meet a little later. And behind the scenes on the tech side for us tonight is our communications coordinator, Alex. I want to thank both of them for their work to bring us together tonight. And I wanna thank uh, all of you once again for coming. Most of all, I want to thank the New Chatlet people and their leadership. The fight that you're mounting is one that you shouldn't have to, but it's inspiring. And having the opportunity to stand behind you is, is really a privilege. The Nuchatla are a small nation and they're fighting uh, the might of the provincial governments who have gone out of their way to make this uh, process as drawn out and as expensive as possible. And a key way we can help out is by supporting the Nuchatla financially. So we're going to put the link to the Nuchatla's crowdfunding campaign into the chat now. Uh, if you're in a position to support this nation, uh, I ask you to, to please do so. To set the stage a little bit and provide some, some visual context for folks who don't know New Chatlet territory, we're going to start with a short video, just under four minutes, by our friend Dan Pierce, who's a Vancouver-based filmmaker who's doing and has done some video work for the nation. So Alex, if you could cue that video up now, please. Growing up in the Chatlets was, uh, it was the best world that I know of growing up. Had everything that we needed. Life was filled with family, filled with pride. Every morning we'd go to the beach to harvest sea urchins, abalone, mussels. We'd all eat together and it was always so much fun. Those were the best days of my life being out in New Chatlets. The abundance was there because we didn't access for wealth, we accessed for need. There was a lot more of everything. A lot more fish, a lot more game, a lot more fall. When the non-Aboriginal people hit our shores, they seen the wealth of the ocean, they seen the wealth of the land, but their wealth was personal gain. The forestry has taken a lot of resources out of our territory. When the logging company comes in, they log and they leave, and it looks like a bomb went off. I see them logging all around us, and I don't see anybody asking permission. Our fish are dying off because of the logging. It's all connected. The fish, the forest, We've depleted them to an extent where we need to look after it. We need to set aside something. We can't go and access a good cedar for a canoe, for a totem pole, because somebody else owns that land. And we're saying, no, we own it. We need to manage it. We need to control it. We've never relinquished Nichat, so we truly believe it's ours, yeah. We have to ask for help. You know, we need help. We're small, but I think there's people out there who can help us. We're not just fighting for New Chatlet. We want to show the world that we can manage better, protect better, and we can enhance better. 
and there'll be enough for everybody. I want my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to be able to come back home. I want them to learn how to fish. I want them to learn how to go down to the beach and dig for clams when they need to. What I'd like to see in the future is us to be on the fishing grounds again and be able to teach our grandchildren about this is what your grandfather, great grandfather done to be able to work here and make a living for their family. New Chatlet was a paradise. I think it can be that way again and I want the world to be able to come and visit New Chatlet's to see the beauty and just want it back. Everybody will know about New Chatlet, this tiny little community that's taking on the province, Canada, and the logging companies. We're 180 strong, and we will win. We're gonna hear tonight from New Chatlet leaders uh, and from their lawyer. Uh, you should be able to see them on their screens. Uh, and after the three speakers, we'll have some time for question and, and answers. So uh, a few of you uh, have dropped questions into the uh, Q&A box uh, about the sound for the video. Um, and that's where you'll put sounds, uh, that's where you put questions, pardon me, for the speakers. Um, so yeah, instead of having a speaker and then questions, we'll hear from all three speakers and then, uh, and then questions after that. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker tonight is named Hith Shamanuth or Archie Little, uh, who is a cultural worker for the New Chatlet and is the house speaker for the nation's hotway. I'll turn it over to Hishamanath now to introduce you to his territory and his people. Archie? There, okay. Well, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, this is um, Isa Manur. I speak on behalf of New Chatlet, especially our tie with Jordan Michael, who was just seated not too long ago. And I kind of want to brag about New Chatlet, a very unique place with a very unique history, with a powerful history. And I say that because we've we've always had, we've always, we've we've always supported our hereditary system. We've never had elections. And and I say it, it has a special history because because the people who lived with us in, in uh, New Chatlet while we were growing up, we had uh, we had head chiefs from other nations that lived with us. New Chatlet was kind of a hub of Nucha, uh, of our Nuchanur. We had we had Hatwe from Ihadisit that lived with us. We had Mowichit, Machlat, Tai, Heshkut. And uh, Quatsino, they lived in our, they lived in our community, and and why we're doing what we're doing is, at one time we were okay. And we want to get back to being okay. We want to take ownership, management, enhancement, protection, access, and sharing of our resources which come from the air, the land, and the water, and the people. We've always been a very generous nation who has called, called on other people to come, to come and live with us. We've, we've offered land for people traveling up and down the coast as the resting spot and to gather food as they're traveling. And I just want to mention a thing. Uh, this is all based on Hatwe and Hahotli. 
chiefs and their territory. And our history goes back to Jordan's great grandfather to the 1700s that, that we've been in the hereditary system. That's how, that's how, how far back we've tracked it. But with the people that lived with us, the, the Hawe from the other nations knew where Nechatlit Hahotli is, where the territory is, those two boundaries that are very, very important. And nobody ever questioned our, our Hawe and said, no, that's not your boundary. They respected Nechatlit boundary. And now, and now we've had some changes by people who speak English. And, you know, we feel that, you know, we got it written down and, and it's always been there as is. But, um, but we as First Nations peoples, we feel we can do better for those that are around us, those that live with us, those that live close to us, those that are part of our communities that we live in the same area, and how we help each other, and how we stand up for each other. And, and color does not matter. We know they're, they're, we strive for local benefits. It's sad to see where most of our resources go across seas. And we have our people who are suffering from, from um, medical issues because, you know, because we don't eat the natural resources that we're so rich with. And you know, we need to get back to our ways and we'll be strong, healthy, and proud again. And so hopefully that, you know, that that we can understand that we were okay. We only took what we needed. We shared what we had and we traded. We traded what we had. The money, money, money became evil when the average when the non-aboriginals would hit our shores they seen the wealth of the land the water the air and the people but their way of thinking was personal gain not not a you know, not a community gain where everybody shared in that wealth and and we've had problems where the nation that stands up to fight for the herring, and where the nation that stands up to you know, fight for all the resources for better management, we want we want other people to you know, to enjoy you know the wealth that we have, but it has to be managed first. We just can't keep accessing and accessing because we trusted we trusted the federal government. We, trust, we trusted the, uh, the provincial government telling us that we'll never ever need, that we'll never ever run short. And now we're struggling just to keep the herring alive. You know, we fight for that. We're, we're the first ones to speak up and we're the first ones to go to the front of the line. And so, and so hopefully, that, hopefully that we can see what, you know, what we can do together that you know, could at the end of the day, you know, could I, I have every faith that Jack will do, I will do an awesome job and win. But the first question I want to ask after we win is, could how do we work together? How do we make things better? How do we ensure that everyone you know benefits you know, from the wealth of the Nechatlet nation? And and me being me being the political person that's involved with fisheries in all, in all aspects of fisheries I speak, um, I speak loudly and, and, and I've been in Cape Breton, I've spoke there, Saskatoon, you know, wherever I go, that's the first thing I speak about is our governance. And I, and I, and I even had a lot of interest from people in Alaska, you know, they know about Nechatlet you know, because of our governance. And my late friend, Hilamish, that we just lost not too long ago, 
He was a great friend of mine. We, you know, we often spoke about our way, that New Chatlet's way has always been a hereditary system. And in our lifetimes, we'll never see an election. Not, you know, not, you know, not that we say it's bad, but you know, the way we do it is that, you know, we we put people in there to look after families in our in our council. And so and so it's not about you know, what we can promise the most, but you know what we can do for our families, that we heal, that we get strong, that we get proud, and we try and focus on our children. We we you know we're told in the courts that we have to think the seven seven generations down the road. And we take that very, very seriously because at the rate we're going, you know, we'll be two generations and we'll have nothing. And it all stems from, from uh, you know, mismanagement of climate change, ocean warming, fish farms. You know, we have to be very careful in what we do and we have to make those changes together to, you know, to improve to improve what we have and to have the utmost respect you know, for those natural resources that that was given to us to look after and to share and to manage and to enhance and to protect access you know so And so, you know, just um, just in closing, that the New Chatlet is so unique in the, in a, in in a, what we've done. You know, the, you know, the people that we as kids, you know, growing up, we assumed they were New Chatlet, These people, you know, because they lived with us, not knowing till later that you know the you know, the Savies were the Tai uh, of of uh, Ihadasit. But Louis George was Tai Hawith of uh, Machlat. And we had uh, John Jumbo from uh, Mowichit. And we had uh, Norman Charlie, who married Paul Smith's sister, Mary. And they were from Quatsino. And, and, and we have a reservation on uh, Kitala Island that was offered for, for our people to be traveling up and down the coast to rest and to access resources and food as they're traveling. And we've even offered the Ihadisits in a piece of land while they were, while they were having problems with their, uh, one of their chiefs and, and they were allowed to stay there until they worked things out and then they went back home. So, you know, we're a very generous First Nation and we're small, but we're very proud, and we're very loud. And I just want to say thank you to, you know, to those that are listening, and to, to, and to you know, understand that you know our driving force is Hotway and Tahoe, and that you know we were okay, and we want to be okay again. And, and I think that you know that working together is the quickest uh, solution. And you know, we've heard a lot about, we've heard a lot about uh, reconciliation. And I just read uh, Ma Nelson Mandela. He said, those that reconcile build nations. That's, and that's, and that should be our focus that, you know, working together to make everyone strong to make everyone healthy so and and um, you will hear uh, hear a lot about about the chatlet abandoning our territory our hahoshi if we did that we'd all be dead we'd be killed off because we cannot go into somebody else's hahoshi and live and access they were, you know, they were fiercely, fiercely protected. They had, uh, you know, they had lookouts in the, in the strategic places, and they, and they knew what was going on at all times. And those, 
and and a chief was never dishonored. They were always called. They were always asked. And we have and we have stories of two whales that were caught. Where Domovichit killed a whale, and they killed it right on the boundary between between Mowichit and Nuchak. They towed the whale in, and they sent somebody to you know, to call the uh, Tai Hatwit of Nuchak to, to come and get half the whale, because that's how much respect they had you know, for the boundary and for the hotware of that nation. And so hopefully that we can all work together, that we can all understand each other, you know, to accept that you know, we do need changes, you know, changes for the better, changes for our children, changes for our grandchildren, and it doesn't matter what color they are, that you know, we need to do it for everybody. That's always been our mandate. And so, so with that, I, I hope I've enlightened some people that they, they come forward and you could help out a little bit. And if you do help out, Taku Taku Chu. Thanks, thanks so much, Archie. Um, that context and that that history is is so valuable and and thank you for for setting for sharing that tonight. Uh, our next speaker is Jack Woodward, a lawyer who's been working for the New Chatlet since 1980 and is currently working on their title claim in the Supreme Court. If you follow Indigenous rights and title law in this country, Jack's is a name that you've probably heard. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Jack. Well, thank you, Torrance. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Archie, for that beautiful talk. And I'm so grateful that everyone here is uh, present to, to, to be part of this webinar. Um, because this is a, although the New Chatlet are a tiny nation, what they're doing is of huge importance um, for the rights of Indigenous people in British Columbia and across Canada. And it's of huge importance to the project of reconciliation, the great Canadian project of reconciliation that's ongoing. And if anyone was ever nervous about that, if anyone ever wondered if, if reconciliation was a good idea and they may have just heard what Archie just said, he said the first thing they're gonna do when they get their land back is they're gonna say, well, how do we work together? Wouldn't it have been great if the Europeans who first took away this land had that attitude? Well, how are we gonna to work together with these First Nations that we've just taken their land? And here's this amazing spirit of, of generosity that comes from the Nuchatlet that they, the first thing they're thinking of is once they get their land back, and they will, they say, well, how can we then work together? They are a generous people and a gracious people. And what marks them, and, and the message out of what Archie just said, is that they are known amongst the New Chatlet Nation as the center of hospitality. We would use the word hospitality. But what that means is, is that they, they host and support and nurture the other tribes as a kind of a uh, a homeland within the homeland. They are the original central tribe of the New Chatlet peoples. And if someone ever has a hankering, if a New Chatlet person ever has a hankering for the real New Chatlet, New Chalnoth experience, it's New Chatlet and their beautiful ancient village at New Chatlitz on Nootka Island. Nootka Island was the place where the first Europeans who came to North America arrived. The, uh, not just the Spanish, who called the whole of their claimed colony from that went right from Northern California to Alaska, they called it Nootka. They named it after their original fort that they built on Nootka Island at Friendly Cove. And, and the British, when they came, when Captain Cook came, where did he come? He came straight to Nootka. That's where he came. And he met Chief McQuinna and he met the new Chatlet people. And the Spanish and the British and all of those sailing ships that came in the, in the late 1700s um, they all met and called them New Chatlet people. They were the New Chatlet people. They were, and there's an unbroken written history of the New Chatlet people from those days to, to the modern. It's, it's the most extensive, well-documented history of a people who lived on their land um, in, in, in all of Western Canada. Um, in, in Western United States for that matter, because this was the central place for, it was known because of the, it was the center of the maritime fur trade, but it became 
a famous place. Uh, in the 18th century, people in Europe knew the name Nootka more than they would know uh, any other place on the west coast of North America. And, and this is the homeland that uh, right now uh, the New Chatlet people are fighting for. What they're doing, they're in British Columbia Supreme Court in a lawsuit to get their land back. They're seeking a declaration of Aboriginal title to their ancient uh, historic land which is the northern part of Nootka Island. And, and I, I just want to emphasize that they, that name, New Chatlet, occurs continuously from in every journal of every explorer and missionary and trader and government official from uh, the late 1700s to the modern day. There's no doubt that these are the people who have always been there on that land, um, living in their home on Nootka Island. And the specific issue that I want to talk about tonight that's of importance and it's, and it's, and it's a political issue uh, and something that all of you might want to take a position on and, and be involved in is that in this court case, this court case that, that, uh, that the Nootchatlet are bringing to get their land back, the government of British Columbia is a defendant and they're entitled to file a statement of defense and in their statement of defense, they say, they, they plead as a, as a formal pleading that the court has to be satisfied that the new Chatlet did not abandon their land. So they put abandonment squarely at issue. The question of whether or not the new Chatlet abandoned their land. And that's a real troublesome pleading because when you think about it, abandoned abandonment, what, what you know, if you, if you, uh, if you take a, a, a trip to Mexico, have you abandoned your house? How do you prove that negative? How do you disprove the negative? How do you prove that you are continuously in occupation? And um, uh, we say that that's uh, oppressive of the province of British Columbia. And I'm going to show you why it's not just oppressive. It's wrong. It's actually illegal um, in, in, in my presentation tonight. They didn't abandon their land. Um, here's here's what happened to them after the first Europeans came. They had first of all they were in in, in they had terrible diseases, uh, including smallpox. They had to suffer uh, uh, when, once the once the sea otters were gone, and the smallpox had come through. Then they were. I'll tell you who abandoned them was all the Europeans abandoned. They were left in 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 a situation of distress and poverty through the whole of the 19th century. Um, uh, the government paid no attention to them. Um, but then when the government did pay attention to them, they had to uh, deal with residential schools, laws from the government of Canada prohibiting their potlatch, the central cultural institution of the people. There were laws that prohibited their, uh, prohibited them from actually performing their dances, which is the way they communicate from generation to generation, their culture. It was illegal, for example, it was actually specifically illegal for them to hire a lawyer. Uh, it, it, it was very oppressive until 1951. They were not, it was a criminal offense to either be a lawyer or be hired or to hire a lawyer to fight a land claim. And, and that was actually enforced. You know, there were actually people that I've spoken to who remember going to jail in Tofino for participating in a potlatch. Uh, so anything the government, uh, despite everything that the government did, uh, the governments of Canada and of British Columbia, the New Chatlet people stayed there tenaciously honoring and living on their homeland. It was the opposite of abandonment in, in practical terms. They, they stayed there against all odds, against through the winter storms, not just that, but through the, the storm of colonialization that hit them so hard. Now, uh, the land, I, I just wanna talk a little bit about their land. Uh, it's, it's dominated by the, these amazing cedar forests. Um, huge grow, archaeologi ar archaeologists describe them as culturally modified trees, groves of culturally modified trees. And culturally modified trees are living trees, but that uh, have evidence in them of human use. So if you strip bark from a cedar tree, it will it will form a lobe, it will grow, but it will continue to live. But you can find, but if you look like in the tree, you can see that the year that the bark was stripped, the tree continues to thrive. And then it can be, the bark can be harvested in a future year and the tree continues to grow. And these trees can be ancient and they can be uh, interesting shape of, of multiple lobes 
not 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 because that's how the tree wants to grow that's because they are they are continually harvested generation after generation as a source not just of bark but also of of planks so the bark of course was used for um clothing and mats and hats and ropes and diapers baskets nets the, the whole foundation of the culture um based on on the cedar bark and then of course um the wood itself you can actually take a plank out of a cedar tree and the tree will continue to grow and they use those planks for their magnificent houses and and then sometimes of course the trees would be down and they made uh, house posts out of them uh, to hold up those big giant wooden houses they made and also for their huge ocean going canoes which they used to visit neighboring tribes and to go out into the deep sea and hunt whales. Uh, it was an amazing uh, relationship between the people and those cedar forests for hundreds of generations. And, and, and when the Europeans came, they were still fully intact, enormous cedar forests, despite all of these generations of intensive use. They really were, Europeans would use, now would use the word gardening or farming. These were cedar farms because what they did was they managed to use those trees so intensively, but at the end of the day, the trees are all still there. It's, a, it's an amazing example of what we might call permaculture or a permanent sustainable relationship between the people and, and the, uh, those, those cedar forests. One of the most incredible relationships that the world's ever seen right there on Nootka Island. And, and sadly, uh, um, uh, a huge amount of that forest has been cut. Uh, we'll come to that later, but there, some of it is still remaining. Some of those magnificent old growth cedar forests are still there with the, with the evidence of human use right in the tree, right on the bark. It's an archeological, it's a magnificent archeological record of, of human occupation, uh, unequaled anywhere in the world. Um, and it's kind of scandalous when you think about it that we, you know, we would think we would think it would be appalling if the uh, if the Greeks went and 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 uh, quarried the uh, Acropolis for marble, and yet what we have done in our culture is we've we've quarried the these cedar archaeological sites. Uh, for cedar shingles, it, it's it it's it's really quite a shocking thing to do to to a, an archaeological site like that. Um, but that's not the main issue that we want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the injustice that's happened to to the New Chatlet people um, in, in this regard. But I also want to mention, of course, that they didn't just take the cedar; they hunted in those forests for deer. And of course, in the forests are the uh, are the lakes and the rivers that had these incredible runs of salmon. Uh, and, and so the Nuchatlet people, when Europeans arrived, were wealthy. They lived and owned land that was generating enormous wealth so they could live in, 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 in comfort and uh, they didn't have deprivation of, of hunger. They were, they were, in, they were wealthy people uh, living in their, in their kingdom, so to speak, um, living well off their land. The government of British Columbia, in the in the official pleadings in this case, say that they abandoned all that, and and you know of course they didn't abandon it. Here's what actually happened. First of all, the government of British Columbia, right off the bat, when when as soon as the colony existed, passed a land act declaring that all of the land belonged to the crown, and then they passed a forest act saying that all of the trees on the land were under crown management. Those same trees, and then they issued licenses to allot those trees to private companies. So that, so that the, the, the trees didn't even belong to the crown anymore. They belonged to private companies who were not just allowed, but were ordered to cut down the trees. And all of the game became the property of the crown. It became necessary for New Chatlet people themselves to get a license to hunt the game. It was illegal because part of the Nutka Island was made into a park. It was illegal for New Chatlet people to even pick berries or even light a campfire in the park. It, they didn't abandon their territory. They were forced off their territory. Their land was expropriated without compensation. Their land was stolen from them. That's what happened. It wasn't abandoned. So it's unjust and it's unfair and it's 
um, uh, an appalling thing that the government of British Columbia still pleads abandonment uh, about about the, the relationship between the new Chatlet people and their land. It's, an, it's, a, it's a real insult. Um, and, and so what I'd like to propose to you tonight, all of you who are here, is that we, we unite in, in uh, asking the British Columbia government to live up to a particular promise that it's made. So uh, what happened was uh, a year ago, the government of British Columbia passed a statute um, called the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. A historic statute. It's it's quite an amazing thing. It it uh, what it what it does is it adopts UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it makes it part of the law of British Columbia. Historic. No other legislature in Canada, maybe in the world that we know of, has taken UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration, and made it part of domestic law. A British Columbia has done that. It's a great accomplishment. Uh, that British Columbia did, and I'm, I'm very proud of our government for doing that. I, I remember uh, being at a, at a meeting in Victoria uh, a year ago and seeing uh, Premier Horgan receive a standing ovation. 700 people were in the room. They all stood up on their feet and gave uh, Premier Horgan a standing ovation about that accomplishment, about that specific thing. He said, and we passed this statute, and they all stood up and gave him applause. Uh, you will have recalled in the most recent provincial election campaign, one of the things that Premier Horgan said when he ran for re-election, when one of the accomplishments that he stood behind was the fact that they passed that statute. Now I want to tell you a little bit about what that statute does and what's this disconnection between the statute, the high aspiration of that statute, and what actually happens on the ground. The pleading of abandonment. There's this big gap that we need to close. Um, what, uh, since then, I, I want you to know that the Nuchatla people haven't just sat around. We have been to meet with uh, government officials, with uh, members of the legislature, with members of cabinet, and we've said, you passed that statute, you've adopted UNDRIP, now Implement it. Now, stop saying that we abandoned our land. We've met with all of them. They know that New Chatlet are there. They know that New Chatlet are complaining that the government is still pleading abandonment in this court case. It's time for them to stop doing that. Um, I want to tell you what UNDRIP says. The United Nations Declaration, I'm going to read you the, 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 the passage. It says, Indigenous peoples have the right to the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used or acquired. That's subsection 26.1. And 26.3 says, States shall give legal recognition and protection to these lands, territories, and resources. That's... It's powerful language. British, what that means is British Columbia must give legal recognition and protection to the lands that the New Chatlet have traditionally owned and occupied. And this, that, so that, that UNDRIP, that international treaty, has, is adopted as the schedule to British Columbia statute, which is called the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And so the statute itself, which adopts the whole treaty as its schedule, the statute itself says this. It says, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples, the government must take all measures necessary to ensure the laws of British Columbia are consistent with UNDRIP. Must take all measures to ensure that the laws of British Columbia are consistent with the declaration. That's the promise. That's the promise that's made. It's not just a promise. It's a legislated mandate. It's required that every government official act in compliance with UNDRIP. Now, last month in October, on October 8th, the Sinux case was heard by the Supreme Court of Canada. That's a case about uh, whether or not uh, 
certain First Nation that's now located in the United States, but uh, used to be in Canada and basically got driven out of Canada, whether they have rights to hunt in Canada. And without getting into the complexity of that case, one of the things that British Columbia says in that case is that they abandoned their territory in British Columbia. So uh, New Chatlet um, intervened at that case. We intervened and as interveners, uh, there was about 15 or 20 interveners uh, got to speak at the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada is operating by Zoom, just like this nowadays. Uh, we didn't actually go to Ottawa, uh, but we it's got all of the pomp and, uh, and ceremony of the Supreme Court of Canada, except it's by Zoom. Uh, it was kind of funny, actually. I had to put on my full court robes and sit, you know, at, on, at my Zoom in my, in my office. <laughs> um, Anyway, we had five minutes, like all the other interveners. And in those five minutes, I'll tell you what we said. We said to the Supreme Court of Canada, look, British Columbia is pleading abandonment here. They're pleading abandonment in the new Chatlet case. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. Not only is that pleading wrong in law, it's also unlawful for them to be pleading that now because they've passed a law saying they won't ever do that. So they should not not they don't have to the Supreme Court of Canada doesn't have to weigh the submission about oh, whether or not abandonment is is lawful or not all they have to do is disregard those submissions because British Columbia has now promised in its legislation that they won't do that anymore now look it's it's hard to draw it's it, I'm proud of our government for passing this fabulous statute but it's a big organization and all the way down all of those staff, all of those lawyers that work for the government, all of those deputy ministers, all of those uh, civil servants, the message has to come from the top. You now have to change your behavior. You now have to act in accordance with this law. You can no longer undermine First Nations who are claiming their Aboriginal title. You have to support them. You have to take all measures necessary to implement the United Nations Declaration. That's the mandate. It's required. It's the law. And that's what we said to the Supreme Court of Canada just on October 8th. New Chatlet, little New Chatlet, went to the Supreme Court of Canada and said that. And now here we are, back to our case, our project at hand. The first, the first claim in coastal British Columbia of Aboriginal title, the first time that a First Nation is going to say, OK, time to implement not just the Chilcotin decision, but time to implement UNDRIP right here, right now. Let's, let's stop fiddling around. Let's stop clear cutting these ancient forests and let's look at the fact of who actually owns these forests. Let's take this seriously. That's what the new Chatlet are doing. And it's funny that it's such a tiny little First Nation, but, but they're tiny, but they are so authentic. The new Chatlet nation are one of the real true original, authentic nations that still in a powerful way maintain their traditions and are respected up and down the coast for being who they are, for being that, having that ancient tradition of hospitality, of generosity, of pride of who they are, and of, despite their small numbers of willingness to put up that fight, to say, we're gonna stick up for what's right. So we're all, kind of lucky, I think, I feel lucky to, to, to know Archie and, and Jordan, Jordan, I call him Jordan. It's like calling uh, Queen Elizabeth Lizzie, you know, I mean, he's, he's the tie of, of, of the new Chatlet nation. And, and I can get away with calling him Jordan because I know him, but it, he has a, he has an ancient and honorable title. And, and he is as to the New Chatlet nation as Elizabeth is to the British nation. He's, he's the head guy. And he holds that position uh, as a kind of super trustee on behalf of that whole community. And he's tasked with trying to get that land back. And it's wonderful that all of you are here participating in this webinar and able to to, to hear Archie, I, I, I just want to rehearse a little bit of what Archie did. He took you through some of those histories of all of those family connections. 
you know, he knows, Archie knows who people's grandparents and great grandparents were and, and all the way back the line, you know, you talk to your friends in the, in the non-Indigenous community and say, can you name, can you name all eight of your great grandparents? How many people can? Archie can. Archie knows. <laughs> he knows that history because that's who they are. They are the people of that land. They've always been there. So with that, I, I, I want to thank you for listening to me go on. I want to emphasize that this is about a particular problem that we can solve. We can solve this problem. We can solve it now with this newly elected government. We can say, okay, do the right thing. Stop pleading abandonment. Do that. That's a good way to start. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, I've, I've I've had the privilege to hear you explain the explain the the ins and outs legally of this case and the uh, the government's uh, abandonment argument and three or four times and it doesn't make me any less mad each time. Um, so I, I appreciate the work you're doing and 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 the way you've broken it down for us. Our final speaker tonight, uh, Jack started to introduce him a little bit. Uh, already, uh, Klakwiskum is the Tai Hatwe of the new chatlet, and uh, Jordan Michael, I'll, I'll pass it over to you now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> there we go. Yeah, no, I just want to thank everybody for, uh, you know, trying to understand what we're actually going through here, you know, it's a uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, pretty tough to sit there and watch uh, Jack battle the, the government, you know, the, the, in court. And uh, just after this undrip was um, announced or whatever, and just to see the blatant disregard for, you know, any of the, <laughs> I guess, um, you know, the the new legislation or, you know, any of that, you know, or, you know, no, no sign of good faith whatsoever. So, you know, I mean, um, yeah, it's just good to be able to share that with you and hopefully uh, find somebody that will actually help us, uh, you know, um, talk to the right person because we've been uh, talking to everybody and it seems to be falling on deaf ears within, uh, you know, the government and the courts. So, I mean, um, you know, it's uh, here we are. It's uh, it's a little frustrating, you know. And there's uh, the COVID's not helping much, but I mean, um, you know, we're just hoping for the best. And uh, thanks for thanks for hearing us. Okay. Thanks. Um, right now, we'll move into the question and answer uh, portion of the webinar. Uh, we've had the question and answer tab open at the bottom of your screen uh, this whole time. There's a couple questions in there already, I see. Um, if you've got more, you can submit them now. And for folks watching on Facebook Live, uh, we're checking there too. So uh, you can submit some questions uh, in there as well. I'll pass it over to my colleague, Emily, now, who will uh, facilitate this part. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so we have our first question here from Anna. Um, she says, since the system was designed to legitimize itself as a colonial authority, do you think that it will be successful? This is for Jack. And she also asks if this is the first of many more to come. If you want to unmute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anna. Thanks for that question. And, and uh, it's an important question. Now, in the interior of British Columbia, the, the Chilcotin nation uh, took a case and, and, and won that. And so that was the, that was the icebreaker. Uh, the Chilcotin, it, it was a big project. It took 25 years. I, I was their lawyer. We, we started it in 1989. And we finally won in the Supreme Court of Canada in 2014. Um, uh, and uh, that established that, that Aboriginal title exists. You can have, a, they, they own their land. The Chilcotin own their, their, their territory. Um, it's different in coastal British Columbia because the trees are so much more valuable than up on the high and very dry Chilcotin Plateau where the trees are not very valuable. In fact, it's probably not economically viable to log those trees. So, um, whereas on in the coast, this is a very valuable resource. And so uh, it's a different fight, but yes, this is the first one except after Chilcotin, this is the first such case. And, um, uh, and so the government and the forest companies are putting up quite a defense. 
Um, uh, the precedent is strictly clear that Chilcotin case was a was a success, so it should apply here. Um, and uh, and there's no distinction to be made between those two cases, except procedurally, it is quite possible for the for the defendants to throw up enormous procedural barriers. And and this defense of abandonment is is that kind of a thing. It's a procedural barrier. It's a way of making it difficult and expensive and complicated to get to court. So um, that's what we're going through. We're going through uh, a kind of like uh, like Napoleon's Russian winter. You know, it's like we're fighting our way to try and get to court against this uh, these huge odds that, of course, the government has uh, unlimited resources um, to fight us. And um, we don't have unlimited resources. Uh, there's uh, um, not much more than what you see on your screen in front of you. Uh, and, and so we're doing our best. Um, and what we're saying is, is that it's, um, it's dishonorable of the government to throw up phony defenses. And, and certainly abandonment is a phony defense. There's no, I mean, there's no, obviously there's no substance to it. There's, there's no way the new child people abandoned their territory. And so to, to drag us through that is simply a way of delaying justice. Um, uh, you know, you ask us, there's many more to come. Well, for sure there's more to come. And, and uh, but there's something, there's something satisfying about a small, and very authentic and very genuine and 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 beautifully documented and well um, situated First Nation that doesn't have doesn't have complexity to it. That's that's it's the it's like the they're the they're the real thing. I mean, the Nuchatla are are a, 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 an indigenous nation that has been there and and has all of its traditions intact and. There's absolutely no reason. There's not, not no reason whatsoever that they should not uh, get achieve this result. So, um, uh, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's 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 going to be a struggle. But uh, and yes, they will win. Uh, but the question is, how will, will we allow our, our elected provincial government to to throw up these phony barriers to it? I quite well. I, I'm I I want to just lead straight into the next question that's on the screen, which is what kind of evidence? The evidence is, it comes from the people, from the New Chatlet people, and from uh, also from uh, a huge body of historical documents, all of which mention New Chatlet. Everybody who ever came to the coast mentions the New Chatlet. So it's it's kind of unshakable. It's, 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 it's beyond any question, beyond any doubt that the New Chatlet were there when Captain Cook came and everybody since then. And and so, so it's it's great evidence, and it's fascinating historical material. It's like all of those old books; um, uh, they all mention the New Chalet, every one of them. So it's 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 a wonderful, and and uh, for like a student of history, or you know, it's 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 amazing because you think, well, I wonder if the New Chalet are mentioned. Yep, they're there, right there, front and center. So that's a nice thing. Jack, there's one other question to follow that one, which is where and when does the court case happen? Well, um, we don't have a trial date. And one of the reasons we don't have a trial date is because there's uh, a, a, uh, the government is saying that they need more time to organize their evidence of abandonment. We're saying you don't need any more time to organize evidence of abandonment. First, you shouldn't be pleading it. And secondly, there is no such evidence because there was no abandonment. So, you know, we're struggling with that. Now, we're going to bring that to a head sometime in the next few months to say, look, you, you, enough's enough. But we shouldn't even have to do that. They should just drop that pleading of abandonment and then we can get on with the trial. And the trial, will, you know, the trial should be short. Um, we've all heard rumors of these trials that lasted hundreds and hundreds of days and cost millions of dollars. I said at the outset to our case management judge, I said, this should be a two-week trial, no longer. Why would it take any longer than that to prove what everybody knows, that these people have always been there on their land? Great, thank you, Jack. Um, the next question is for Archie and Jordan. Um, the question is about who holds the forestry license and is doing all the logging in your territory. Um, and do you have any relationship with them at all? And that's from Cameron. Okay. 
Yeah, that'd be Western Forest Products. Um, uh, and, you know, I think just up until a few years ago, they have they were doing most of the logging themselves, but recently have just contracted it all out, you know, subcontracted it. So, so yeah, no, no relationship with WFP though, no. Not a good one. <laughs> Right. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the next one here we've got from Kathy. She says there should be one law that applies to all First Nations with regard to the land and UNDRIP. It's possible to fight them. It's impossible to fight them all in court. There should be some strategy to manage them all. That looks just, sorry, that looks like a, just a comment, but thank you for that, Kathy. So I'll move on to the next one. Um, is the forest around the upper Zabello's River part of the New Chatlet territory? If so, are you involved in stopping lo logging old growth and that just started there in the last year? That's from Victor. You're, you're muted, Jordan. No, no, that would be a, he had us at territory, I believe. I'm not sure what's going on there. I believe they might be interested in uh, salmon parks, so I'm not sure if that has anything to do with uh, the development or, you know, the restrictions of logging or whatever in that area. So not exactly sure. <laughs> Um, this looks like about it for questions on here. Well, can I, uh, a couple of things that um, uh, Roz Isaac says, key points, and Joy Hoffer, uh, how can we best provide, provide support other than financially? And I, I appreciate that question because it's not just about money. This is about, um, I mean, you know, you could donate $5, but you probably you might have more impact financially by persuading the government to drop the defense of abandonment because that would save hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it, it, you know it's uh, this is political. Political is your best tool here to and and so anything you can do and you talk to your and you know and the, and so Roz Isaac asked the question what what's the key point I can make? Well, the key point is live up to UNDRIP, live up to live up to your promise to implement. UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and stop pleading abandonment. And that applies to not just to the New Child, but to any other First Nation that wants to go to court um, uh, uh, to get their land back. So uh, yeah, this is, this is a political thing. The government, you know, the, the, the government doesn't have to give those instructions to their lawyers. They can tell their lawyers to do the right thing. Uh, uh, lawyers don't just act on their own, especially government lawyers, they're given instructions by the cabinet minister. So the cabinet minister can tell them what to do and tell them not to do that thing that they're doing. Yeah. Can I keep going on the court? Because Melissa Jack asked an important question. She says, how do I read up more on the case? How, where would she read up? And I think that's a really good question. I think we should have a, I don't know if we have one, we should have a web page where we can do that. And let's get back to Melissa about that because there should be a place where, a central place where somebody could go and read up about this case. There's lots of material about it. Um, uh, I could I could individually send stuff to Melissa, but that's, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, that's gonna be a laborious process. So let's, let's put it on a web page so that she and anyone else who wants to read up about it can find things. Yeah, we could work on that for sure. Thanks for that, Melissa. And then I have a lot of questions here about how to get involved, how to take action, how to put pressure on the government. All of that stuff will be answered in a moment um, in our closing statements. So stay tuned for some of that information about how you can take action and get involved. Um, I see one question here from Megan. Are the logging companies involved in the case against the government? Surely the ownership of the land is an issue with the government. It, is, it doesn't seem possible that the corporations could be involved. Jack, do you want to answer that one as well? Well, it's a good question. We we are required uh, because we're we're 
going to cancel their licenses. We are required to join them as defendants. Um, but the, they are, um, they're not fighting as hard yet. Uh, they're sort of just riding on the coattails of the government. Uh, so the, the questioner is correct. The main issue is between these two nations, the New Chocolate Nation and the and British Columbia, um, a, a, that are fighting it out about a fundamental constitutional question. Um, the forest companies, as happened in Chilcotin, in, in the Chilcotin case, uh, what happened was when they won, the Forest Act was suspended. The Forest Act was eliminated on Chilcotin land. So what will happen here is when the New Chalet win, the Forest Act will cease to apply to that part of Nootka Island. And therefore, it'll fall like house of cards. The licenses that were issued to those forest companies will disappear. So yeah, they're, they're defendants because they're going to lose everything. Um, I imagine they'll turn around and sue the province for their loss. Great. Um, I have a question here. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Emily Sarchi. Uh, Jordan said something really important that uh, that I need to expand on. Sure. And, yeah. and uh, it was about salmon parks. And uh, one of the driving forces behind salmon parks is New Chocolate. We moved, you know, we moved to start that work. And that work is to protect our creeks, to rebuild them to enhance them so our salmon have a home to come to and they'll spawn and get healthy and go back out to the ocean. But we look for solutions. You know, we just don't wanna, you know, because I don't want people to think that we just want, 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 but you know, we wanna manage what's left and, and to ensure that it keeps growing. But, you know, but the salmon parks are there to to rebuild the creeks, to protect them, to enhance them. And, and, our, and our biologist, he always makes it clear that we will never see the end result of what we're starting, but we have to do something. And we're the driving force behind that because it's a solution. Thank you. Thanks, Archie. Um, I have a question here from Carol. This is for Archie and Jordan. Um, is a blockade being considered at all? Could I take my orders from Jordan? No, we haven't. I mean, that's like a last resort, I think. I mean, so, I mean, if it came down to it, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have a problem with that, but hope we don't have to go there. <laughs> Great, thanks, Jordan. Um, one more question here. Um, just looking down here, which BC cabinet minister is important to contact in order to leverage maximum pressure to honor UNDRIP and stop the abandonment defense? Well, I think it's the premier and the attorney general would be the two key ones and the minister of indigenous and relations. Now we know who the premier is, but he will, uh, Premier Horgan will be appointing a, a new cabinet. So I don't know if uh, David Ebby will continue to be the attorney general, he may well be. Uh, or someone new might be the attorney general. Um, uh, but whoever that is, that's the person to talk to. And, and also uh, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and also your local MLA, each MLA. And also the, the, there's nothing wrong with talking to uh, uh, an opposition uh, MLA. Um, you know, Mr. Olson and Sonia Furstenau uh, of the Greens and any member of the Liberal Caucus who may well take an interest in this. Uh, every MLA has a voice in the legislature and can raise questions on the floor. And, and the more that that's done, the, the, the more political pressure will be made. Great. Um, and then we've got a question here from Dan, Dan Pierce, who's actually the filmmaker. Um, he said, for Archie and Jordan, when you win this case, what possibilities or opportunities will this open up for you, you and your nation? Um, what are some of the outcomes that you wish to see after this case is won? 
well for well for the chocolate we've had yes, many, yeah for for new chocolate we've we've had many discussions and 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 the and the one thing we talk about is that we're going to remain who we are we as you know we as new chocolate people that that we stand firmly with behind and with our hot way and our hotly that you know our our kids, our children, our grandchildren know who they are, where they're from, who they're related to, and that history will get out man, a lot quicker. And and hopefully that that uh, you know the government will see that court is not the answer sometimes. That you know we need to come together and and uh, negotiate, you know, versus spending millions in court. But you know, but 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 for but for New Chatlet to maintain who we are, to to understand the wealth that we have in our in our Thais Hahothi, which include herring, halib, salmon, eels, ducks, you no, know, all the natural resources. And the people, of course, you know, we you know we you know we educate our our people into who we are. That, you know, we're always talking about our history. We're always talking about New Chatlet, you know, where we grew up, who grew up there, who lived there. And that's going to continue. That's going to, that's probably uh, fully recorded. So, you know, people will know who they are and who the New Chatlet are. And they're very fine people. Thank you, Archie. So we have time for probably one more question here from Megan. It says, didn't the NDP say that they would only apply DRIPA going forward and not retroactively? And now that the NDP have majority, what is the likelihood that they're going to listen to citizens? Well, well, first of all, I'll just ask, I'll answer the legal side of that. DRIPA, that, that is the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, which is the statute that implements the international treaty, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So there's a provincial statute that implements provincially an international treaty. The, the underlying law is that international treaties don't apply as domestic law unless you pass a statute to do that. Canada hasn't done it even though Canada signed the treaty, but British Columbia has done it. So it makes it part of domestic law, which is, that's historic. So, but how do you force the government to implement it now that they've done it? Like they, they have to do it. Are we gonna have to take them to court to make them do what they said they do? This is not a new problem. We have, you know, I, I did, can I take a minute to just say, Right at the very beginning in Canada, uh, the, the Royal Proclamation that founded Canada in 1763, started with a promise to Indigenous people that says there was great frauds and abuses. That's the language. There was great frauds and abuses against the Indian people, and we're going to fix that. That's what it said. And that's 1763, talking about history before that, that was fraud. And so the, the premise of Canada, the very basic document that started this country, and everything since then, you have governments at the highest level saying, we're not going to keep treating these Native people so badly. We're going to do better. Even Gordon Campbell's government talked about a new relationship, right? And, and so now here we have this new statute that's just less than a year old and the government making this high promise. And yet here we are struggling to get, get it into effect. We are making progress. I don't want to be, dis I don't want to be despairing. This is, this is progress. We're doing way better in British Columbia than in Alberta. You know, I, I mean, I've, I've worked in Alberta for native people and it's like a different century. So. British Columbia is progressive, and 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 I, I'm proud of our government for doing what they've done. It's just difficult in a democratic society to advance minority rights. Native people are a minority. They they don't form a large part of the electorate. They don't. They're not the people that politicians go to to get reelected. The 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 vast majority of British Columbians are not native people, and the government has trouble doing the right thing when it comes down to on the ground. And what we need to do is persuade them to do the right thing morally, or, or we will beat them in court. Of course, we'll beat them in court if we have to, but that's a long struggle. 
let's ask them to do the right thing now. And, you know, look, we have to believe that they've acted in good faith. This is the government that actually did this, right? They didn't have to, they did this. And now they have a majority, they're feeling secure. It's the beginning of their mandate. This is the time when they can make unpopular decisions, right? I mean, because it's not popular to support native people. So, but, but they're, but it's the right thing to do. So this is the time when the government of British Columbia can do the thing that's difficult and perhaps unpopular and actually do the right thing here. And so, I mean, I, I'm, I, I don't want to be cynical about this. I want, I want to be optimistic because I think that's the best way to go forward here and to say, look, government, um, now's the time right now and right this year, as soon as the new cabinet's appointed, uh, uh, do this. Uh, it's a great question. I appreciate the question. I'm just giving you my proposed solution, which is, yes, let's hold them to their word. Thank you, Jack and Archie and Jordan. Um, that kind of wraps it up for the Q&A portion. Thank you all for all the great questions. Um, now I'll pass it back to Torrance to talk about how you can take action. All right, it, uh, it sort of feels like we're just getting going, uh, just digging into the issue. Um, hopefully all of your uh, interests are peaked and that you wanna be a part of, uh, of this campaign to support the new chatlet moving forward. Um, step one is to, is to help get the word out about this. Um, share the crowdfunding campaign uh, in the chat here. Uh, we'll have the recording for this webinar uh, posted online shortly. I think the Facebook uh, live feed should be up on the Wilderness Committee's page right after. Please share that around. Um, it's critical, uh, you know, the last few minutes have been around discussion uh, of, of, of what we can do to push the government politically. It's critical that the, the BC government, the new majority government, know that the general public is watching, uh, the people that, that, that elect them or not are watching. Uh, so please take a few minutes to let the premier know that his government has to treat the new chatlet honorably. We have a letter writing tool uh, with info about the court case. Uh, the legal language was, was authored by Jack, um, and it'll be dropped into the chat right now. And uh, essentially, you can you can use this uh, to, to fill out your letter, hit send, it goes to the premier, and it goes to your local MLA. And in a few weeks, once the cabinet ministers are named, uh, there'll be a new uh, Indigenous Relations Minister, for sure, because Scott Fraser, the old one, uh, retired, didn't run again, uh, and the Attorney General. So they'll get uh, your message and, and hopefully get with the program and as Jack said uh, earlier instruct their lawyers to do the right thing um, you can write more than one letter so wear that thing out write a letter every day um, you know it's a it's a way to raise your voice it's a way to let the government know uh, that, that we're watching if you want to stay in the loop uh, on this and other things we're working on uh, there's a link in the chat now uh, for e-alerts uh, we'll keep you posted what's happening about this other ways that you can take action uh, you can also follow the the Wilderness Committee and the Wilderness Committee of Vancouver Island on Facebook, as well as the Friends of New Chatlet on Facebook. Uh, there's an online auction uh, to help raise money. So maybe you don't have a ton of, uh, a ton of money to support uh, the crowdfunder, but you're an artist or you know an artist. Uh, you can, that just launched on Facebook today. Uh, the link will be in the chat now also. Uh, you can start posting your donated items now and the bidding will start on November 19th and run until December 3rd. So please invite your friend, uh, invite your friends, share that. And uh, again, finally, most importantly, uh, the biggest way we can we can support the new chatlet is is with costs to help cover the legal battle. Um, the the last link again in the chat now is the crowdfunder. So uh, dig deep and support this if you can, and uh, and share it around. Write those letters and uh, and let's rally behind this nation because you know they're small and mighty, and and together all of us we can be big and mighty. So uh, yeah, looking forward to. Uh, to, to getting into this with all of you. Thanks, Torrance. And just to close out tonight, I would like to invite Archie, Jordan, and Jack to share any closing words. Go to my first. Yeah, go ahead, Archie. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, just, well, just on behalf of our Tai Hatwish, Jordan Michael of the New Chatter. We want to thank you. We want to thank everybody for coming to listen, to hear, to donate, 
to help, to understand mostly. And our Tai appreciates that. And just a little more, a piece of the history. Good Nuchatlet was hit hard by the residential school process. Nuchatlet was hit hit hard by the, the by the Indian Act process. That little that little IR was abandoned with no kids all winter because all the kids were in Christie, and uh, and and we were forced to be silent. We were not allowed to speak up, but now we're over that. We're healing, we're getting stronger, and we're speaking up now. We know what's right. We know what we have to do, and we know who to ask for help for, from. And so just on behalf of our Thai Hatwith, we say Tako, Tako, Cho. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for hearing us out, you know, giving us uh, an hour or so of your time to understand what's actually happening here. And, um, you know, if it's, uh, if you can, you know, just uh, help out, write a letter or whatever. I mean, you know, anything helps. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, I also thank everyone who participated and listened to this. Our lives as Canadians are enriched by uh, living with our indigenous people who who it, it's a privilege to live in this country in, in the land that they own and we learn from them our lives are enriched by them and i thank them for 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 this opportunity to become a person living here so thank you archie and thank you tai jordan michael for for being here and leading us in this way Yeah, thank you so much, Archie, Jordan, and Jack, for, for being here and sharing. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, I hope that you can take action as soon as you, you're you done with this webinar. Um, stay healthy and safe and, and have a great night. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, thank you.